and welcome to a very special event that we are pleased and proud to present at the Africana Studies and Research Center today, a conversation with Dr. Matthew Knowles. I am Gerard Atching, a faculty member in Africana and Romance Studies, and I'll be presenting our speakers and moderating today's discussion. On behalf of our director, Professor Olofemi Taiwo, who has expressed his regrets not being able to attend today, and the faculty of Africana, we'd also like to extend a very special welcome to our students in the audience. We take note of your interest in today's event, today's public conversation, and we hope that the discussion that you're about to hear will whet your appetite for more such discussions at events like these and in our classrooms. So, welcome. I'd like first to thank our generous co-sponsors who have helped to make Dr. Knowles' visit possible. They include the offices of the President and of the Provost, the College of Engineering, the Society for the Humanities, the English, Music, Communications, Performing and Media Arts Departments, the American Studies Program, and the Cornell University Hip Hop Collection. Interesting constellation. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We've had invaluable assistance from our staff, Donna Penisi and Triva Levine, and Dr. Knowles' assistant, Lynn Almanza. Donna and Lynn have worked very hard to make this event happen, and we're deeply appreciative of their efforts. Now, to begin today's event, I'd like to invite our all-female gospel a cappella ensemble Baraka Kwa Wimbo to the stage so that they might uplift us with song.
of an arc of activities that began with Professor Roche Richardson's research on the internationally acclaimed star Beyonce in a book whose working title is Emancipation's Daughter, Reimagining Black Femininity and the National Body Beyond Aunt Jemima. In the fall of 2017, she introduced some of this scholarship to students in a new undergraduate course, Beyonce Nation. The course not only drew 67 students on this first occasion, but also drew the attention of our guest of honor, Dr. Matthew Knowles, Beyonce and Solange Knowles' father, who reached out to congratulate her on the course. The opportunity to engage Dr. Knowles in conversation this afternoon demonstrates the kind of mutually beneficial relationship between scholarship, teaching, and public engagement that is the very heart of Cornell. Dr. Knowles' expertise as professor, entrepreneur, and keen observer of black social and cultural life in the United States is the focus of today's conversation with Marla Frederick, Professor of African and African American Studies and of Religion at Harvard, and Roche Richardson, Associate Professor of African American Literature here at Africana. This occasion promises to demonstrate how the public discussion of ideas can also provide informed entree points for our teaching, our scholarship, and our reflection. I'm pleased to say that Dr. Knowles has been meeting with students and faculty across our campus today, as well as with civic and religious leaders across Ithaca. Dr. Knowles, we warmly welcome you to Cornell and hope you enjoy our, your stay with us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for most coming. May I ask our, uh, Dr. Knowles? How's everyone? <laughs> I want to bring some energy to the room. <laughs> so, um, our guest of honor today is Dr. Matthew Knowles. Dr. Knowles is professor in the School of Communication at Texas Southern University in Houston and is the founder of Music World Entertainment. He is a celebrity regularly featured in popular media who is greatly renowned and respected for his breakthroughs and innovations as a top manager and entrepreneur in the music industry. He has launched numerous artists into chart-topping, award-winning careers. He is best known for managing the award-winning singing group Destiny's Child, along with the solo careers of its members, including his daughter, Beyoncé, the multi-talented, iconic superstar who has won more Grammys than any artist in history, and her sister Solange, who is a multi-talented singer, songwriter, actress, and music producer. Dr. Knowles is the recipient of many awards, some of them ranging from a MTV Video Music Award, the 2011 Living Legends Foundation Award, the Century Award of Excellence, 1911 to 2011, from the Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity, to be honored also by the city of Houston with the declaration of a Matthew Knowles Day. He is an active and longtime voting member of the National Academy of Recording Artists, Arts and Sciences and serves on its Grammy Board Committee. In 2011, he was appointed to the Board of Directors of the Gospel Music Association and we're very pleased to be able to host Dr. Knowles on our campus to dialogue about his two books, The DNA of Achievers, which came out in 2015, and Racism from the Eyes of a Child, published last year. Joining Dr. Knowles this afternoon is Marla Frederick, Professor of African and African American Studies and of the Study of Religion at Harvard University. A graduate of Spelman College with a BA in English, Professor Frederick earned a PhD in Cultural Anthropology at Duke University where she completed research on issues at the intersection of religion, race, class, and gender. She continued her work as the post 
doctoral fellow at Princeton University's Center for the Study of Religion and at the Interdenominational Theological Center's Office of Black Women in Church and Society. Professor Frederick is the author of four books and several articles. Her first ethnography, Between Sundays, Black Women and Everyday Struggles of Faith, University of California Press, 2003, is an ethnographic study of Baptist women's social and political engagement in Eastern North Carolina. In 2007, she co-authored a book entitled Local Democracy Under Siege, Activism, Public Interests, and Private Politics, which won the Best Award Book Award for the Society for the Anthropology of North America. Her most recent book, Colored Television, American Religion Gone Global, Stanford University Press, 2016, explores the rise in African-American and female tele-evangelists tele and their influence outside of the United States. My colleague, Roche Richardson, is an associate professor of African-American literature here at Africana. Her other areas of research and teaching interests include American literature, gender studies, and Southern studies. Her essays have been published in journals such as American Literature, Mississippi <coughs> Quarterly, Forum for Modern Language Studies, Black Renaissance, Renaissance Noir, Transatlantica, The Southern Quarterly, Black Camera, Inca, Phyllis, Technoculture, and Labris. Her first book, Black Masculinity and the U.S. South, From Uncle Tom to Gangster, came out of the University of Georgia Press in 2007 and was highlighted by choice books among the outstanding academic titles of 2008. Currently, she serves as the co-editor of the new Southern Studies book series at the University of Georgia Press. Professor Richardson is also a visual artist whose mixed media applique art quilts are the subject of a chapter in Patricia Turner's Crafted Lives, Stories and Studies of African American Quilters, 2009, and of a short film by Anne Cremieux and Geraldine Chouard entitled A Portrait of the Artist, 2008. Her quilts also featured in Lauren Cross's film The Skin Quilt Project in 2010. Professor Richardson's current book project, which focuses on black femininity, is called Emancipation's Daughter, Reimagining Black Femininity, femininity and the National Body Beyond Aunt Jemima. In fact, had it not been for this research and the teaching that it generated, I'm referring to Beyonce Nation last fall, the course that she offered, we all probably would not be attending this event today. <laughs> um, I would like to turn over now to questions that will be um, posed by uh, Dr. Richardson and Dr. Frederick. And, uh, we will be doing that, we will be looking at some clusters of questions, and then also, I hope that you've written some of your questions, or will write some of your questions along the way, because we'll be able to pick them up, and then I can look through them and just sort of bring them together, so that we can ask questions uh, toward the end of this public conversation. Okay? So, uh, our first cluster of questions focus on the book that Dr. Knowles published last year, Racism from the Eyes of a Child. I'd like to preface these questions by citing Dr. Knowles in the introduction when he writes, <coughs> quote, I could never mend the country's racial chaos in a book, but I am sure I can fix a chaotic part of myself by writing it, end quote. I'll turn to Marla, um, Professor. Thank you. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here at Cornell. I want to thank uh, Dr. Shea Richardson, Dr. Gerard Aiken for organizing um, the event. And um, it's just a privilege to be here and, and talk with Dr. Knowles about these two uh, really incredible books. Um, and so my first question comes kind of as an anthropologist, um, racism through um, from the Eyes of a Child um, is a book that takes us through it. Um, Dr. Um, Knowles explores his family history through this text. And what's really powerful in the book, um, it makes one profound insight at the very beginning. He says, racism uses at its primary base an eraser 
to rub out histories and facts. It says racism uses at its primary base an eraser to rub out histories and facts. And so one of the things I deeply appreciate about the book is your willingness to explore your family history. Um, to interview multiple family members, to record the good, the bad, the troubling, um, and to connect your history to your present. Um, I think you do this incredibly well. And so I'm curious um, about what made you decide that this re research was important, that this was a project that was important now. And I imagine that you could have hired any number of historians or genealogists to do the work for you, but you went into the community in Alabama and interviewed your family members. How did you decide to do that? And what was the most challenging part? How did you decide? What questions did you ask? What was that process like for you? Well, it's a 10 point part question. It is a 10 part question. <laughs> but, but I first want to just say thank you. And thank you, Dr. Richardson. Uh, this has been an incredible, I'm going to come back to it. It's been an incredible day uh, for me. I've met some incredible people. Uh, and, and you guys are special. So what you see tonight is unrehearsed, is what I do, and I, I just give you me, how I do me. Uh, so the question is the chaotic part of me that I, I wanted to, to really, it was therapeutic in a way. Uh, I talk about in my book, uh, the 10 years of therapy uh, from, from racial trauma uh, that I, that I uh, in, had to go through. But I think it's important I give you a little, little context. How many of you know uh, or have ever been to Gaston Island? Raise your hand. So I'm the only person in this room that knows about Gaston, Alabama. Well, I'll tell you a little bit. It's 25,000 people. I was born in 1952, so through the math, let me tell you how old I am. Uh, my mother went to high school with Coretta King, uh, Andrew Young's uh, wife as well, from Marion, Alabama. Uh, and I never went, this is going to be probably amazing to you, I never went to a black school, although I'm 66, until my junior year of college. So you're looking at someone that integrated a lot of formats, a lot of challenges came along with it. And that's that chaotic part that I had to find and understand about myself. And that's what this book did. A lot about my family, I didn't know. I didn't know that my grandmother, Hester Hogue, um, had twin brothers. Sydney and Gidney. I don't know why they named them Sydney <laughs> and Gidney. Uh, but that explains the DNA of Beyonce having twins. And, and so a lot of things about this book, I didn't even know my great-grandfather's name on my father's side. Didn't even know his name, knew nothing about it. So it was, it was that that initiated me wanting to research. Uh, and when you talk about it's racism uh, erases, it wants to erase our past. Think about, and we won't get on politics, but think about our current president, how he tries to erase everything Obama has done, President Obama has done. That's an example. Uh, and it's here, it's alive and well. And I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to have a social courage. That's the word I'd like for you to take away tonight, is social courage. The responsibility that all of us have to speak up, speak out, sooner, quicker, faster, about xenophobia, homophobia, racism. We should have the social courage to do that. And so that was some of the reasons. You know, I feel like Beyonce. Beyonce performs, she starts out slow, and then there's a certain part of her, and I know she's ready. I'm ready. So thank you for the question. I'm in a music industry. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm, I'm really thankful and truly excited that we have come to this monumental event today after so many months and weeks of planning and a lot has gone into it. So I'm just deeply thankful for everyone who has helped with the planning and made it possible um, to my uh, colleague, Gerard Ajit here, who was just so instrumental in helping to bring all of this together, as well as Victor Younger and our um, current director, uh, Kevin Gaines, as well as our interim director, um, Bimi uh, Taiwo. So there's been a remarkable, remarkable community of people who have brought all of this together. And um, we're really privileged to be here. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Knowles, for um, your support of my teaching and encouragement. I really appreciate it, and it's been deeply inspiring. Um, my first question for you addresses the ambivalences that people often feel about the U.S. South is simultaneously a site of terror in the minds of a lot of people of African descent, and at the same time, a symbolic home place. So the DC <coughs> is figuring at, as a home repeated in films and various texts and popular culture in a romanticized and nostalgic way even in a lot of instances, and yet, its um, ubiquity as a site of trauma because of histories of slavery and Jim Crow looms large. So there's, there's a, a, a complex image of the South in most people's minds. I'm fascinated by the emergence of the quilt as an image in your, um, your memoir borrowed from one of your relatives uh, Dr. Oscar Underwood Jr. And um, as a quilt artist myself, I, I find the metaphor fascinating. But in general, there are a couple of images that ground this um, compelling memoir, Racism from the Eyes of a Child, including the eye on the one hand and the quilt on the other. And, uh, and I actually ended up on my first book, cover in 2007 wasn't actually my uh, choice. It was the graphics um, department at, at my press. And I'll never forget, you know, just looking up on the computer, because I had a fantasy of what my book cover image should be um, that spanned back to my interest in Spike Lee's films. And there's a certain scene from school days that I was imagining from the time I was a graduate student as the one that should go on my book. And so I remember I was talking to my grandmother about something and all of a sudden twirled around in the chair and there it was looking right back at me. And I really didn't have a lot of choice. But over time I've really come to appreciate the image and so that's something that um, like makes me feel even kinship at a visual level with racism from the eyes of a child. I'm just wondering about why the quilt and the eye are there as images for a good question. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. that's it. So when, when I was thinking about what would I title the book, what would the image look like, uh, I opened the book with this story, a uh, true story. When I was five years old, uh, my mother would take my brother and I, my brother was nine years older than me, uh, we would go to what we call the country, uh, Marion, Alabama. And so my mother and my grandmother were like oil and water. They just didn't get along, Hester Polk. Uh, at this particular night, my mother made a bad choice. She decided around 10 o'clock at night, after an argument with my grandmother, that she was gonna take my brother, Jesse, and I, and we were gonna go to the nearest relative, which was about a mile up the road. So first, we had a dirt road we had to walk down. And here's the main highway. So I want you to visualize 10 o'clock at night. And it's kind of like the journey last night from Syracuse to Ithaca, where there's no lights, it's dark. Then uh, you're in a taxi and you're kind of scared. 
But here we are walking up the highway, and it's nothing but the light of the moon and the stars. And in the distance, we could hear these sounds and we could see the lights. But as they got closer and closer, as a five-year-old kid, I could tell my mother's body language changed, uh, that something might be wrong. And so she said, suddenly, we have to get in the bushes. We have to get in the bushes now. And, and so here I am, a five-year-old kid, and I'm not understanding what's going on. <coughs> then my mother literally gets on top of me and starts praying. And she tells my brother, Jesse, if anything happens to you and your, to me, or you and your brother, are to go up under this bar, barbed wire fence and this cattle on the other side of the fence. And I just want you to run. So the lights got closer and closer and brighter and the horns got louder until suddenly they passed. And I'm crying. My mother's telling me, Shh, be quiet, be quiet. And I still, as a five-year-old, you don't understand this. And, and so once the cars passed and we got out of the, the woods, the bushes, there was a bunch of flags on the highway. And like a kid, I'm curious, and I'm picking up the flags, and she spanks my hand because they were Confederate flags. And what we had just witnessed was a KKK rally. So can you imagine, had they saw us, what the outcome would have been at 10 o'clock at night in Marion, Alabama? And so that's where the eyes of the child, because I'm telling this story from my eyes that started for me at five years old. And then Dr. Underwood, who is my second cousin, he tells a story of, about a quilt, the beauty of a, a quilt. And then yet it's ugliness that's really up to your eyes to see and deliver. So that's how I came up with Thank you so much. And uh, following up this question, I have another one that's very rooted in my disciplinary perspective as a scholar in African American Literary Studies. I'm excited by how much <coughs> your memoir resonates with the voices of uh, several figures in African American literary and cultural history. Um, Especially as I began the reading, it was resonant with the voice of Richard Wright to the extent that he, in his fiction, recurrently mentioned the ways in which the black body um, was routinely terrorized on the southern landscape. And then also there's this use, this profuse use of um, images, like metaphors that you um, infuse throughout the, 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 the manuscript that I think make it um, just noteworthy and um, very compelling from a prose standpoint. And another author who comes to mind is W.E.B. Du Bois, a uh, major uh, father in African American intellectual history. And racism from the eyes of a child reminds me of Du Bois, it's inherently Du Bois, and I think even on a number of levels, including um, in the sense that it invokes failing and the just this kind of double consciousness that was at the heart of Du Bois' intellectual project that was rooted in part of psychology, but in other ways as well. Du Bois presents his story as one that tells the, tells the story of the broader African American collective, as, as, uh, as some critics have noted, and you, you do something very similar in your memoir, where on the one hand, it's a, it's a kind of individual story that you offer, but it, it invokes a collective African-American voice, and to that extent, it's very multivocal in, in um, how it comes together. And then there's another dimension that I think is very important 
to acknowledge where it's, 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 it's about how one can experience traumas in childhood that last a lifetime, that has traumas that have a lasting and, and lifelong impact. So your work, I feel, needs to be read in African American literary classrooms and other kinds of classrooms throughout the country because it's compelling in that way as literary work, I think, on its own terms. But I'm wondering in general um, how about how you relate to African American literature. Who are the writers that you read? Who are, you, who are the writers um, you think we should be reading at this point? The writers that we should think with and know? Well, I, I like Matt, Malcolm Gladwell, Bob Myers. That's my, yes. that's my favorite book. Come to come. Uh, nice. love, love that book. Yes. Uh, but you know, you, you, first of all, thank you for that, ladies. Uh, and images can be very, very powerful. Uh, and I share some of the, those stories of, of trauma. For example, when I was growing up as a kid, I think I went to the dentist. Uh, and I'll share this with you. I, I, I need to be at the dentist because I, ha I literally have gone to therapy to go to a dentist. Because at 12 years old, I went to the dentist for the first time. And there was a colored section and a white section. And so, if you were in the colored section of a dentist or a doctor, uh, you didn't get treated on until the white patients got treated. And so, imagine if it's 3 o'clock your appointment, and it was 6 o'clock before the dentist got to you, white dentist, he was in a hurry to get home to dinner. And, and you guys are too young to, to remember there were colored sections, there were colored bathrooms. There was colored water fountains. So here I am, first time at the dentist to get extraction. And my mother, of course, wanted to go into the room with me, to the exam room. Uh, and the, the dentist nurse was adamant that she could not come in the room. Uh, my mother was fairly adamant and would read the book, Helen, my mother's name, Helen. She was no joke. She, she, she stood up, she stood her ground. So she said, no. So the short of the story is, the nurse said, you have two choices. You can either leave, or you can let me take your son into the, the chair, the dentist uh, exam room. I sat there what seemed to be an hour with all of these needles, and the, all of those loud noise, noises that were back then, extremely loud, by myself, at my first anxiety attack. So I have this fear at 66 years old about going to a dentist. That's how trauma works. That's why I can identify when a woman says that she was traumatized 25 years ago. I can identify with that. It doesn't go away. So I, again, wanted to share. This is about folks having a dialogue. You know, I was saying today, change is supposed to be uncomfortable. Change is not supposed to be comfortable. I want people to feel uncomfortable. And I want folks to dialogue about racism and talk about colorism, which I talk about in the book as well. So that was a purpose. Uh, I've learned as I'm writing my own style, I like to have others tell their story. So I have my sister, my first cousin, uh, on my mother's side, on my father's side, uh, and one of my classmates in junior high school that, that shared what it was like uh, going to an all-white school, a thousand white student, and the six of us, what that was like. Uh, folks, I'm here to tell you there's some people that's paid some really prices for all of us to sit here today including their lives, including their lives, so that we can all be here today. So I, I feel as, as though it's a privilege for me as well to be sitting here today. So, uh, Dr. Nels, you mentioned, uh, you gave us a segue when you mentioned the word colorism. Fact, well, you and I had already talked about that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so in fact, that was another set of questions we had about your memoir. 
Um, and it had to do with colorism and the ways in which you poignantly demonstrate how the prejudices of colorism can be inherited and passed on. I know that um, uh, Professor Frederick also had a question about that, and it's also connected with this. So, how many of you all have seen <coughs> Saturday Night Live's hit, Beyonce Turned Black? Okay, so for those who haven't seen it, we, we queued it up for you to see it. international appeal. Uh, and I teach this in the intro to the recording industry. Um, and one of the first days of class, I just challenged my students, do you know the average population demographics in America? How many white folks are there? How many black folks are there? How many Hispanics? How many Asians? So approximately 16 million Asians, approximately 35, 38, 40 million blacks. 60 million Hispanics, 230 million whites. So if I was selling this, by the way, I'm not getting a check from this one. I'm not getting a check from this one. They're not one of the sponsors, are they? But, but, but you know, if you, you can make a choice, do I want to sell this to one demogra demographics of what I want to sell to mass appeal. We, from day one, wanted to sell to mass appeal internationally. So some of the things that we did was just from a marketing perspective of how to get mass appeal. So that's the first thing. Beyonce has evolved, as I was sharing. So can I ask what that looks like to, to have crossover appeal? What does, what, so, what kind of decisions do you make aesthetically or with lyrics or how does that work? So I can Columbia Records is who Destiny Child is on uh, and Beyonce is still, still, still on. So I can depend on the $3 million budget, marketing budget, that Sony will give for an album. Or I can go to L'Oreal and say, you know, we'd like to do a commercial, put the song in the commercial, uh, Beyonce gets a check, we get another check for putting a song in there, but we get, instead in front of 10 million people, 40 million people. That's one of the ways of building a, a, a partnership with Walmart, or Nintendo, or Mercedes. You know, we've done over 27 endorsement, major endorsement deals, major endorsement. Right, so you're saying that it's 
Scott, who has a book, Preachers All Wax, and talks about African American preachers entering into the market to sell their tapes early on when tapes first started, but that for them to be signed with some of the larger labels, they had to not talk about politics and race. Like those kinds of themes had to not emerge in their, in their sermons. And so then, for artists today, or for the time that you were doing crossover appeal, was there decisions around lyrics or the sound of the music to make it have more crossover appeal? Well, it was always about female empowerment, mm -hmm. independent woman, mm -hmm. women, bills, bills, bills. Uh, your favorite song, you know, place uh, <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't think of that all. Uh, all of those were uh, female empowerment. That's what it was about. And that was a conscious decision uh, for female empowerment. So that did play a role in it. But as Beyonce has gotten older, uh, again, I share, when you're 15 years old and starting out, uh, no record executive is going to let a 15-year-old make a multi-million dollar decision. That's just not going to happen. So most people forget she was 15. Uh, as she's gotten older, you know, mid-20s, now in her 30s, She's taken more control over her career. But initially, she didn't have that business control whatsoever. Uh, that actually came from my team, uh, coming up with the, the marketability of the brand and building a brand. You know, when I got into the industry, people were selling records, not building a brand. And, and there's a major difference in building a brand. I hope I answered. You did, you did. And so it sounds like the brand that you were building was a brand around female empowerment. Correct. For Destiny's Child. Which can be women across cultures. And by the way, the choir were awesome. I saw at least three Destiny Child groups. Thank you. Um, we were speaking about the question of colorism in the context of success, and there are also other ways for us to be speaking about success. Um, and, and I think also important for the students in the audience is thinking about the relationship between success and their education. So we had a, a, a couple of questions along uh, those lines as well. So, um, Professor Richardson? Well, I, um, I just uh, with you, not only because both of us are from the state of Alabama, but also because both of us attended Catholic school. In my case, I attended from first through 12th grade. For elementary school, I attended St. John the Baptist Catholic School in Montgomery, and then went on to St. Jude Educational Institute, which is best historically known as the final camping place for Selma to Montgomery marchers in 1965. At St. John, the Order of Sisters um, was the, the, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. And at St. Jude, the Dominican Sisters. So Catholic education has been foundational uh, in my intellectual formation. I'm ever intrigued by the extent to which um, Catholic education can also energize um, philosophical thinking, and even revolutionary thinking, ironically enough. I, I know that you were an altar boy in your uh, Catholic school experience, and, and yet and still there have been limitations in some instances in the Catholic educational model. You know, sometimes it's been known to be um, authoritarian and restricted. I think a lot of those um, um, strategies and tactics had lifted by the time that I began my education, but um, and it's also a bit heavily um, ritualized in a lot of ways. But I'm I'm really curious about what your um, what the impact of Catholic education has been in your life. I don't see it in your writing or, or kind of um, think about it um, in the sense that there's a certain level of literacy and that Catholic um, teaching can routinely build in students because of the um, diligent training that one gets in writing and uh, 
speaking, gaining those kinds of skills that I think are useful for one's toolbox. And I think that it's also been an educational context that's been uniquely um, impactful and effective in producing a black professional class. And so I, I um, am concerned uh, a lot now about the extent to which this infrastructure is being eroded. And Catholic schools are closing all over the place. This has been going on for years. And I wonder what that means, you know. And the shift of emphasis from urban context to suburban, you know, as a site for outreach to students and to an increasingly like predominantly white population. So all those questions are also important, not to mention the issues that we've seen with, you know, the priests and issues of abuse. But I'm just wondering about your um, the impact of Catholic education on your formation in terms of race and masculinity. Okay. So I went to St. Martin de Porres elementary school in Gaston, Alabama, and it was mixed, but predominantly 60-40, uh, uh, mainly Catholics. My mother uh, wanted to be a Catholic so really badly, but she had the voice. So back then, if you didn't have the, the voice, you, you couldn't do that. I agree with you in terms of literacy. Uh, all the fundamentals uh, that I learned, reading skills, writing skills, math skills, were very, very positive. But I will say that one of the negative takeaways that I had to work uh, on in therapy was the guilt and the shame that is foundational, or in my experience, was foundational uh, at Catholic schools that we were taught to the guilt and shame it was always the guilt and shame, uh, which is not. Not a popular response, but yeah, what you see is what you get. <laughs> well, this actually picks up on uh, Dr. Richard's next question. She's talking about the closing of Catholic schools. But another type of school that was instrumental in your life was a historically black college, Fisk University. Mm -hmm. You entered there your junior year. Um, by the end of racism, I mean, that's a fascinating story. <laughs> You all have to read the book. Yeah, you have to read the book to get that, that story. Um, despite the circumstances that brought you to this, your journey <coughs> was not a big thing without that experience at this university. And you speak um, very um, passionately about HBCUs kind of throughout your book. They show up, whether it's this or Alabama State. Um, your wife was a Spelman alum. Um, so I'm curious what that experience meant to you attending this university and your sense of the value of HBCUs today for this generation of young students coming up and how we preserve the legacies there. Yeah. Um, and also, can you tell them, share with them the connection between you and Oprah in Tennessee. Ha ha ha! Well, Oprah and I uh, live in the same apartment complex, and I used to go to her father, uh, Barbara Shaw, uh, there in, in Nashville. Uh, but, uh, you know, I went to Litchville, I shared that. Because he was at Fisk, and she was at Tennessee State. She was at Tennessee State, uh, another HBCU. But I have a chapter that's called Fisk Out of Waters. Because I never really been to an all-black school, so my experience the first day at Fisk was like, what the hell? <laughs> I had never seen anything like that. You know, people changing clothes two or three times, loud music, people loud. You know, I was at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Uh, you know, we had 15,000 students there. Uh, we had 40 black students, 15,000 total students. So I, I had just never been in that environment. Uh, and fortunately for me, what saved me was my fraternity because I'm a member of Vegas Sci Fi, and that was my instant connection with brotherhood is because I had someone uh, that I could really call upon. But when, when we talk about, you know, a whole bunch of things, because, you know, when you look at Fisk, and we talk about colorism. Fisk was an example. When I went to Fisk, I played basketball. 
I would have never been able to go to this. I was too dark. We used to do the paper bag test, the brown paper bag test. And if you were darker than the paper bag, which a lot of folks in this room would not have ever been allowed to go to Fisk University. So that's where that colorism, uh, and we have to talk about the complexion of our different complexions of, and hues of our skin. You know, colorism was imposed on us in slavery. It wasn't an option. Uh, it was um, imposed upon the slave by the slave master. Uh, and that's why we have these various shades of black, let's be honest about it. Uh, so that was an experience for me, because I had, had not been exposed to that. And so how do you give back to HBCUs now? Would you talk a bit about the work that you've been doing at HBCUs? Well, you know, I taught at FISC for, gosh, 2007 to 2009. I Literally, I lived in New York and Houston, and I would fly to Nashville on a Sunday, teach a class on a Monday, and then go back to New York for free. I did it for free. Provost don't get any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Just sign up. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I did uh, eight years at Texas Southern University, uh, both the School of, uh, of uh, Communications, which I think I'm speaking to some of the communication students tomorrow, as well as the School of Business. Uh, I've spoken, next week I'll be at Alabama a and uh, talking about mental illness uh, on HBCU campuses. Uh, so I, I certainly have given back, uh, and that's my way of giving back. I, I thoroughly enjoy the, uh, being a professor. Uh, it's, it's it's educational for me as well. Uh, and then this is, as I sail into the sunset, academia uh, is what I want to do. So, uh, and write books, and lay on the beach. <laughs> on and on and on. I was going to get some questions from the Yes, audience. from the audience in there. Coming up here. Yes. Um, I'll look through them while uh, uh, while we turn a little bit to your other book, actually, um, the DNA of Achievers. Sure. Um, to speak about the complexities of becoming successful, um, and in the book, which came out in 2015, uh, some of the traits you mentioned include, you know, for the successful professional, passion, vision, work ethic, team building learning from failure, thinking outside the box. And the one that is a challenge for us all, which is risk-taking, and I'm thinking also of our students in the audience. Um, risk-taking for you started early. You were among the first African-American students to attend desegregated schools in Alabama and at the University of Tennessee at uh, Ch Chattanooga. Later, you developed ways to assess the pros and cons of risk-taking you know, uh, professionally. So. Is there a cautionary tale about achieving success that you might want to share with us today? Well, you know, I was just thinking one of the traits is being a visionary. And when you're a visionary, you often are taking the risk because it's uncomfortable and it's never been done before. And so you have to explore ways to be successful at it. But to me, the most important traits are two. Uh, first is passion. Because often we don't get to live our passion. We get to live a parent's passion. We get to live a spouse's passion. Uh, we get to live a society passion. But we don't get to live our passion. One of the things that I just require of my students, and I ask them, are you passionate about what you're doing? Or are you doing it for somebody else? Because I assure you, if you're doing it, and this is never popular, what I'm about to say, but if you're doing it for someone else, it'll last three or four years and you'll fail. Because when you live your passion, you never work a day in your life. I don't work anymore. I get to do what I want to do and have fun with it. 
because I get to truly live my passion. And what coexists with passion? Work ethics. You find someone with incredible work ethics, and you'll find someone that's passionate. And sometimes parents say, well, how do I know if my kid is passionate? If you ever have to tell them to go to practice. No, they're not, they're not passionate. I've never had to tell Beyonce or Salon, it's time to go to practice. Jake was telling me, hey, Dad, you don't want to miss practice. But it's truly about living your passion and identifying early what your passion is because what I've found is successful people, highly successful people, because the title is 10 Traits of Highly Successful People, the DNA of Achievers, 10 Traits of Highly Successful People, start very, very early identifying their passion. And for you, it's now. You have to really spend some time on asking yourself the tough question, what truly is my passion? Thirdly, learning from mistakes. You're looking at someone that's made mistakes, who's failed. But failure and mistakes are opportunities to grow, not a reason to quit. Most people quit rather than grow from them. I've never become successful because I was successful. I've, I've become successful because I've made mistakes and I had to learn from them and, and, and not do those again. Uh, and then building this team. It's not I, it's we. And anybody that's successful has an incredible team like the team I've seen today. That's what's required. required. Beyonce has an incredible team that's been with her on an average of 15 years from her personal assistant to her security, the road manager, publicist. They've all been with her for years, just like my assistant, Lena Mons, has been with me for 15 years. Uh, so it's about building that team. Another important, important one, I won't go through all of them, but thinking outside of the box. You know, most people are box in thinkers. And what do I mean by that? Is that we've been conditioned to hear these words in our ear. You know, because you're black, you won't be able to do this. You know, because you're gay, you won't be able to do this. You know, because you're poor, you won't be able to do this. We're conditioned in a box in thinkers. And typically, I literally have a box, and I ask two people to get in the box and ask you to move around. There's nothing but walls when you're a box in thinker. I can't do this because of this. I can't do this because of this. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. I can't do this. And guess who else is in your box? People like you. That's all you want in your box is people that think just like you. You're a hater. You don't have a hater in your box. Right? So those are the things that the DNA of achiever, achievers is talking about. And in fact, the book looks specifically at professional success. Um, and so there are a number of questions that have come from, from the audience that are asking for a slightly different definition of success. That is to say, outside, or maybe including the professional, what do you define as success? Me, success is happiness. When you're 66 years old, uh, and you're blessed to see and grateful to see your kids successful, uh, for me, it's just joy and happiness. It's like I tell someone, money does not define success. Money gives you options. Money gives you options. It doesn't guarantee you success. Some people get that all wrong. But trust me, I'd much rather have options. And so would you have. Um, there was also um, a very straightforward question. What advice can you give to a communication major? <laughs> <laughs> well, we live in an incredible age of technology. Uh, technology will change every way that we live. Uh, and, and that's the beauty about what's going to happen in the field and area of communications, is technology will make a significant impact. You know, when I first got into business, streaming, no one knew what streaming was, you know? Uh, can you imagine? There was a time that 
I grew up, we didn't have a cell phone. Uh, there was a time that I would pick up the phone and it'd be another party, it was called a two-three party line. So literally, at your house, I could hear your phone conversations. There was a time where I had to pull up my car to a pay phone so that I could make a sales call. Technology will change and keep evolving and evolving. That's the wonderful thing that you guys have that we didn't have. So I think it's a wonderful, great time to be in the field of communications, especially media, uh, as this will really change in the next years. I always say you will no longer hear music, you will see music. In other words, every time you experience music, you will literally see a video with it because it brings it to life when you see music. Remember I said that to me. Hearing music, audio is a thing of past. We see music. Um, another couple of questions are asking about Beyonce's success. That is to say, and, and it's an interesting question. Like, what is it like to, to raise a feminist icon? Hmm. It's real good. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, Solange is also good. Yes, and, and I think they grew up in a household where their parents were entrepreneurs. Uh, my former wife, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but Beyonce is my former wife's maiden name. Her maiden name literally is Beyonce. Uh, but to grow up in that household, I was the number one sales rep at Xerox, uh, fortunately worldwide, three out of four years. My mother had a highly successful hair salon. Uh, but to grow up in that environment, uh, I think really uh, had a significant impact on Beyonce. And, and watch her grow as a, a mother. Uh, the other day I had the twins and, and Blue Ivy. I don't know why she does it. I mean, one was on her lap, the other one was trying to walk and knock his head up against the thing. Blue I Ivy's like, oh, watch me dance. I'm like, how do you do this? <laughs> you know? And then go and perform every night to 80,000 people. That's truly impressive to go from zero to every night performing to 80,000 people every night. Professor Richardson, uh, Frederick, would you have any Comment question on the, the feminist icon uh, and this response. Well, I mean, I I'm fascinated myself by Beyonce's history and her uh, formation. And I don't mean that as a punt. I mean literally um, formation over the years as a as a feminist and. Then, uh, more broadly, by the questions that have come up in the early research on Beyonce related to the question of her feminism, forums that have been staged on that question, and the course of the question, is she or is she not? And it's always very um, interesting, and of course, her embrace of the term feminist, I would say, is extremely revolutionary because the tendency in the mainstream or even in the popular arena is for many women to disidentify with or to disavow feminism. Beyonce takes a very different approach by embracing it and you know, citing um, major feminist authors uh, such as um, Chimamanda you know, Adichie. Um, and I think that all of that speaks to her seriousness about and commitment to feminism. As a, as a philosophy and practice. And of course, you know, the political climate that you mentioned earlier makes it all the more crucial that people really know where they stand on these issues. But um, I, I think that in some cases, a superficial reading of Beyonce's vastly um, multifaceted repertoire uh, makes some people just dismiss, you know, offhand this idea of her as being a feminist, but if one is a serious researcher about Beyonce, then one has to 
has to be fair-minded and give credit where credit is due. Well, first of all, I applaud you for your class. You did a job well done. Thank you. Um, secondly, you know what I'm most proud of when I, when I think about Beyonce? Uh, and so much, but when I'm talking about Beyonce, is one, she's very humble, extremely humble. You'll find the most successful people are the nicest, most humble people. They don't have a sense of arrogance, uh, ego, they don't have that. Let me tell you what ego is. I want you to remember this. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. <laughs> ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. That's what ego is. And she doesn't have it. Uh, and, and that is what makes me the most proud is to say that I'm the father of a young woman uh, that just does it right, that lives her passion, that helps people and gives. You have no idea how much she gives of her time, of her money, and helping others. Uh, it's truly amazing. I had one question that squeaked in, finally, and it has to do with the choice of college that the student has, this, you know, so looking at your memoir and recalling, for example, that you in the beginning um, had not attended an HBCU, right, and then you subsequently did that, this student had the choice of going to Howard or Spellman and shows Cornell and sort of has questions about is that the right choice for her? Well, it's absolutely the right choice because I hope I'm teaching here one day. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't ask, the answer is hell no. <laughs> no, I, I truly, I, I just think that you have to do the research. Uh, there's a whole lot of decision making that goes into uh, from a parent, from a student how they make that decision. Well, I'd like to thank everyone very much, and especially our guest of honor, Dr. Knowles. Um, please join me in... I have one final word. Oh, yes, please. please. And I always say this everywhere, every opportunity that I have. I'd like to just tell you a story. I travel a whole lot. I'm in Los Angeles going down the escalator, and there's a nun from Mexico. And she has a, a jar, and it's misspelled, please give a missionary. Uh, and I've learned to give to a hers. And everybody's level of giving is different. To you, it might be a dollar, to someone else, ten dollars. But I don't judge. Uh, and so I gave, and she gave me, the nun gave me a card. And this is what I would like to always leave you with. I have a habit. I have six, seven cards in my pocket. I'll tomorrow put these cards in whatever I'm wearing tomorrow. And the next day, they'll go into the jeans I'm wearing. And I finally read what was on the back of the card. And that's what I want to leave you with. It said, pray not for a life free from trouble. Pray for triumph over trouble. For what you and I call, I just had a mental, mental delay. For what you and I call something, God calls opportunity. What's the word? Struggles. Struggles. What could be another word? Strength. Um, hmm? Strength. I'm sorry? Strength. Strength? Strength. 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 I'm still in here. Strength. 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 But the, the thing is, is in, in what I want to share is that Life is not going to always be perfect. Just like it wasn't perfect for me just then. It's not going to always be perfect. But that's okay. Find opportunity inside of that. But what you and I call adversity, that was the word. Okay. God calls opportunity. We're going to have adversity in our life. Embrace it. Learn from it. Don't panic. I could have just panicked, right? 
got the word. Could not share it, who would have known if I knew the word or not, right? But if I, I've learned one thing, if I don't tell my story, he's gonna tell his story. I prefer to tell my story than his story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the reception outside now. Uh, it's where you can uh, mix and ask. Uh,